So our next topic is something we've already kind of talked about, but haven't realized we've talked about. And this is the types of CSUS pairings. So how are we presenting the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus? How are we pairing them? So this is mostly going to be talking about the order and the uh, sort of occupational timing of our stimuli. So we have, I believe, four different types of pairings that we want to talk about, some of which are going to work better than others. So the first of these is the forward short delay pairing. Um, so a forward short delay pairing is that the conditioned stimulus is going to still be present when our unconditioned stimulus is presented. Um, and so at the bottom of each of these, I've put together these graphics, and this is basically going to be uh, time along our bottom axis, and then um, when they are up is when that stimulus is happening. So here, if we move along in time, there's nothing happening, and then we have our conditioned stimulus starts. So our conditioned stimulus would be ringing the bell um, at a dog. Now, while you're still ringing the bell, while this is still happening, our unconditioned stimulus starts. So while you're ringing the bell, you would take out the plate of food. Um, and so then our conditioned stimulus, the bell ringing can stop while the plate of food is still there. But for the forward short delay, we care that there is this overlap here where they are happening at the same time for a very brief moment. Now, this technique gives optimal learning because if you think about trying to train an animal, the closer together in time these two items are located, the easier it is for them to form a link between the two concepts. So if you hear the bell ringing and then you immediately get food, then it makes sense to think that the bell is indicating that food. They are uh, temporally close together. So next we have the forward trace pairing. And in this situation, we have our condition stimulus happens first, but there is a very slight gap here, a trace of a gap, uh, you might think, um, a slight gap between the condition stimulus stopping and then the unconditioned stimulus starting. Um, this could have been moved over a little bit to make it clearer, I suppose. Um, but there is a situation here where, so the condition stimulus, the bell ringing starts and then stops. There's a little bit of a gap. And then our unconditioned stimulus starts. So you ring the bell, you stop ringing the bell, you wait a moment, and then you give them the food. Um, so this is the best for learning if that delay is very short. That same idea with the short delay where there is an overlap there. Um, the best thing to happen here is if the delay is no more than two or three seconds. So they should be very, very close together. The closer, the better. Um, the longer the delay, the less easy it is for the animals to associate the two things that have um, the next one is actually a little bit easier to remember, and this is simultaneous presentation, where the both stimuli are presented at the same time. So you ring the bell and you give the dogs food all at once. Um, and interestingly, you find that learning is a lot slower to this type of presentation. And that's probably because they're getting the food at the exact same time that they're hearing the bell ringing, so they're not really paying attention to the bell because they have their food. Um, at least that's my humanized explanation for it. Um, but this one doesn't work as good as either of the other two that we talked about. And then we can end with backward pairings, and this is what it sounds like, where we have our unconditioned stimulus first and then our conditioned stimulus. So you give the dog the plate of food, and then you ring the bell. Um, and this is the worst 
way for learning to happen. Um, so you will see very little learning here because once they've gotten the food, once they have that unconditioned stimulus, it's very difficult to go backwards and associate this with something that already happened that they've already reacted to. Um, so you see very little learning when using this backward pairing. And so if we're going to put it all together, we can talk about how can we best acquire this kind of learning? When is acquisition the best? Um, and so it's going to be the best when you have multiple uh, CSUS pairings. So instead of just ringing the bell and then giving the dog food once, you're going to do it 20 times. You're going to do it 100 times. Um, more pairings usually mean stronger learning. Now, that's not always the case. Sometimes you can have special cases where a single, intense, and aversive, unconditioned stimulus can produce what's called one trial learning. So this is the idea that there is an unconditioned stimulus that produces such a terrible unconditioned response that you immediately learn the association. And the example for this is us and food and specifically food that makes us sick. Um, so I use the example of when I was a child, I lived in Southern Ontario where it gets very, very hot in the summers and it was, you know, 35, 36 degrees Celsius out. And I left a bottle of juice in the car for eight hours. And after a day out and about, we got back in the car and I was very excited to drink some apple juice. And so I drank the entire bottle of apple juice, even though it was, you know, well over uh, a good temperature and it had sat spoiling in the heat all day. And so, of course, I threw up. And from that moment onward, I have not been able to look at apple juice the same way. Um, so I had a single intense and aversive unconditioned stimulus that produced a very bad unconditioned response of me getting sick and it has led me to learn that I should never ever drink apple juice ever again. Um, so now even the smell of apple juice, which could be a conditioned stimulus now, um, still makes me feel nauseous. So I have learned to avoid apple juice from a single experience. Um, and that's a silly little anecdote, but if you think about things like people who go through chemotherapy. They suffer that same problem, but it can become pretty life-altering uh, because when you're going to chemotherapy, you're going multiple times. And some people like to eat their favorite foods to help them feel better when they have to deal with that. But they would run into issues where they'd eat their favorite food, then they'd go and get chemotherapy and they'd get sick, and then they'd find an aversive reaction now to their favorite foods. Um, and so doctors have found a kind of neat way around this, and they'll give the patients uh, unique and uh, odd-tasting ice creams, so flavors that you will never find anywhere else, and they give them those flavors right before chemotherapy so that if they do have a one-trial learning experience, they associate getting sick with those weird flavors of ice cream instead of foods that they actually like. Um, but that is a lot of talking about the fact that uh, even though most of the time we want to have multiple pairings, there are special cases where we are hardwired to learn things, um, especially if they cause uh, physical pain or um, making us sick. Both of those seem to be evolutionarily important because they're bad for our survival. Um, other things that enhance acquisition is like when we talked about our forward pairings, uh, specifically forward short delay is the best, but even our forward trace isn't bad either. So one of those forward pairings um, where they are close in time together is going to give us the best chance of acquiring an association. Um, and tied in with that, having a shorter time interval between the onset of our conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. So the closer together they are in time, the easier it is to form that association. 
makes sense. Correct. So if we have acquired this association, we've learned that our unconditioned stimulus and our conditioned stimulus are associated, now what? Well, now we're going to talk about ending that association. And this process is called extinction. So to go through extinction, you're going to have your conditioned stimulus presented in the absence of the unconditioned stimulus. So what you would do is you would ring the bell for the dog, but not give them food. You want to show them that the bell ringing no longer means food. And so this should cause that conditioned response to weaken and eventually disappear as they learn that the bell doesn't mean food anymore. And so we can look at this on a graph, of course. So uh, our strength of conditioned response, so if we're thinking about dogs and drooling, we have very little drool to lots of drooling. Um, and we can look at our acquisition period here. So um, again, they're using UCS, which is annoying. But we have our conditioned sti stimulus and unconditioned stimulus pre presented together over time as they acquire the association. And so we'll peak at some point where they have a fairly strong conditioned response to that conditioned stimulus because they acquired this association. Now, at this dotted line, we switch over and we enter extinction. We want them to stop drooling in response to the bell. So we're going to present the conditioned stimulus by itself. So ring the bell, but don't give them food. And at first, they're still expecting food because they still have that association between the conditioned stimulus and the unconditioned stimulus. So you have a strong conditioned response. But as time goes on, and as they have the bell ringing, and they don't get food, they salivate less and less and less until there's a very weak conditioned response. It pretty much goes away. Now that's all well and good, but we actually end up seeing this weird little quirk. And this quirk is called spontaneous recovery. And this happens when a seemingly extinct conditioned response reappears. And it's usually going to reappear in a somewhat weakened form. Um, and this is usually going to happen after some kind of delay following extinction. And so we can look at the rest of our graph here. So maybe you spend the whole day going through extinction. You've taught your dog that ringing the bell does not mean food anymore, and they've gotten it. Then you go home for the night. So you wait eight hours and you come back the next morning and you ring the bell and you see that they start salivating again. It's not a very, very strong response like we saw at the height of acquisition, but they are still salivating. And so this is that spontaneous recovery. So to make that go away, you have to go through extinction again. Um, and so you extinguish this behavior by presenting that condition stimulus alone again. Um, and sometimes you're going to have to do this process sort of multiple times, multiple days, in order to get that response, that conditioned response, to go away completely. Um, it's just very difficult to go through that process. Now next, I want to talk about two terms, stimulus generalization and stimulus discrimination. And these are going to be two terms that are kind of framing the same idea, but from opposite sides. Um, and so to get you to that point, let's talk about stimulus generalization first. And so generalization is going to be a process where once you've established a conditioned stimulus, so once you have a conditioned stimulus producing a conditioned response, you can get that same conditioned response from stimuli that are near the conditioned stimulus, that are almost the same as the conditioned stimulus, but are slightly different. So if we think about the ringing a bell or uh, playing a tone, like the examples with the dog, 
maybe your bell or tone is at a very specific frequency. And so the dog learns to salivate in response to a 1000 hertz tone or a 1000 hertz bell. Um, now, even though that is specifically what you've trained them to respond to, you might see some generalization where they also respond to some nearby frequencies. So they're going to respond a little bit to uh, an 800 hertz tone and also to a 1200 hertz tone. And so we see that they respond the most to the conditioned stimulus that they were trained for, but there's also a little bit of responding to the other sounds that are close to it. Um, and this can work with color. If you train a pigeon to peck a red square, they might also peck an orange square because it's close to a red square. Um, and so that is called generalizing um, or generalization where you're responding similarly to similar stimuli. Now, as promised, we can look at the opposite of that. And this is the stimulus discrimination. And this is where we focus on the fact that the responding to things that aren't the originally trained condition stimulus are going to be less than to the specific condition stimuli. So um, we can use either of these graphs because they're actually showing the same thing. So generalization is focusing on they are responding to things that are close by. And discrimination is focusing on the fact that they are, even though they're responding, they're responding less to things that aren't our conditioned stimulus. So if you generalize, you apply that to other closely related stimuli. And if you discriminate, you are responding less to things that aren't the trained conditioned stimulus. So they're both looking at the same curve, the same graph here, showing the frequency that we're hearing and how much uh, of our conditioned responding that we're seeing. Um, but the discrimination focuses on how much less you respond. And the generalization focuses on the fact that you are still responding to other stimuli. Um, so to, to tell those apart, you're just looking at how the question is framed. Um, what are we focusing on um, responding less or responding to similar things? All right. So the next couple of slides get us into higher order condition. And so this is when we start chaining events together. Um, so now you're going to have two different con uh, condition stimuli so that you can have, um, you ring your bell and then you give the dog food, ring the bell, give them food. But what if you do something else before you ring the bell to get a response? Um, and this is a little bit more of a complicated process because it's gonna allow us to expand the influence of classical conditioning. We can add an extra step um, and that extra step actually gives us some more applications. But as you might imagine, there is a little bit more involved in explaining that concept. So I'm actually going to leave it here and we'll pick up specifically on higher order conditioning next time, probably also with a review of uh, regular classical conditioning because we're gonna need it to lead into higher order conditioning.